Heather, I really appreciate the opportunity to share my experiences with you. So let's just jump right into it. Um, we're going to give a little, just a little bit of information. Um, Guinea is what, located in West Africa. Landmass is about the size of Oregon. And so it took about two days to get there. We stopped in at Paris. So we fly into Conakry, which is the capital city of Guinea. And where I stayed and spent six months was in Kankan. The distance is about 400 miles. I uh, looked it up on Google Drive or whatever, and it said it should take about eight hours. Now that's if we're going off of paved roads. <laughs> we, went in the r we arrived in September of last year, which is kind of the tail end of their rainy season. And so uh, there's a probably about up to here, maybe, of paved road, and then all of this. <laughs> It's still being, still being developed, so our ride there was 17 hours, and we made that in one drive, and on a passenger van with really poor suspension. It was a <laughs> painful trip, too, but we eventually made it. Um, oops. So, it is a very, I mean, it does bridge that gap of both very traditional and modern. I don't really have any pictures of the capital city, but they do have more, more or less steel and glass structures. Along the way, though, we pass a ton of villages, and as you can see, it's still a traditional mud and thatch roofed houses. Um, that's also an example of the type of road. We have a <laughs> small pothole there, but if you would kind of increase that size about 20 times, you would have some of the potholes we had to navigate. Um, these are pictures taken in the mountain region. Guinea is actually has a diverse uh, topography. There's really four sections that they like to break it up into. There's the coast, and this is the highlands, the, um, which is a source of the Niger River, which one of the longer rivers in Africa. And so it was cool. We did some days hiking. This was actually three months or two months into our trip when we took a small vacation into the mountains. And that was great. Got to see a waterfall three times. That was nice. And just, just really entrancing beauty. Now we're actually in Kankan, and there is a university there. And so this is a picture taken where, for the first month we stayed there, we were kind of cloistered in this university. We stayed in a more like hotel accommodations. We weren't into our homestays at that point. And during that time, we were given a crash course in Maninka Khan, which is the dominant language spoken in that area of Guinea. And this is a courtyard of the university. What you see here are mango trees, which they have severely cropped to, produce, to encourage new growth, I guess, and more fruit. Uh, this is just one of the spots that we would kind of, one of the students actually worked in an area right around here. This is a movie theater that is long since abandoned. I thought it was really cool. It's the first open air movie theater that I've seen that's not a drive in. <laughs> uh, but when you consider that they could go six months of the year without rain, it's not a problem. Um, one shot I have of the market, it can get incredibly busy. And it's also really interesting, the, just the diversity of produce. There, I probably I ate everything that was organically grown, so, and everything is very fresh. Uh, Kan Kan is located on the Milo River, which is a tributary of the Niger. And so every day we ate fish because that's the cheapest meat. From there, goats and uh, cow. That's more expensive. So. My diet mainly consisted of rice and then a sauce that was made with a fish. So, um, there is, it's interesting, the, the commercial aspect in Africa, because most of the goods are imported from China, similar to here, I suppose, <laughs> in many ways. Um, yeah, the Chinese have done a really smart thing. They're putting up solar, a lot of solar infrastructure in the area. And in a, in a way, they get a good trade agreement with them. So majority of the, the manufactured goods come from China, for better or worse. 
These are actually um, made by locals. We see the calabash bowl, which is used for winnowing rice, and also the baskets, which are also used for winnowing rice to get stones or whatever out of it. Rice is very important. Um, the fish market, and smelled like a fish market. <laughs> cool. Some of the people and the fashion I just want to talk quickly about. This is this type of fabric, which I had the opportunity to wear, maybe not the luxury to wear. It's called bazen, and it's actually a wax. Wax is beaten into the fabric, and it's very colorful. Um, so, that, so the red there is wax? It is, well, the bracelet's plastic, and that's probably yeah. beads, but the, the process of making the material is they're taking wax and beading into it. It's a very shiny, kind of almost stiff. Is it hot? Exactly. It's very hot and very <laughs> uncomfortable. Um, they handle the heat way better than I do. So there's uh, another member of the family that would come by, and she would torture me. She was just very, a very sassy woman, <laughs> as you can tell by her posture. <coughs> but once again, I mean, this is another type of the, the more batik style fabrics and the patterns that are involved in it and everything. But just, I mean, it's great. The kids, this is, well, this is going to the Tabaski, which is the festival of the sacrifice of Isaac, which is the main, which is like their version of our Christmas. It's a huge festival. And it ends up being like a three-day party. It occurs in late October, depending on the moon cycle. So our family members would get all dressed up and look nice. And yeah, I did no arranging of this. I just think it's great how photogenic the composition came out with no encouragement on my part. That's good. There's me and my bazen. And I was miserable. But. <laughs> But you know, then again, you, you wear your holiday sweater yeah. at Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And the family I stayed with. It's good. The matriarch of the family. She, very fun. I mean, I can't imagine that they have access to washers and Dryers. Ah, everything's hand washed. How do they keep their clothes so nice and white? Elbow grease and the, um, what do you call those things? Wash the washing wash boards? boards? Yeah, washing boards and soap. And I had a pair of white pants and they stayed white despite the fact that everything is really red and dusty. So actually, it was funny, I came back and my mom said, Holy cow, these pants were gray when you went there and now they're white. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I did a couple times, but then I just paid people to do it for me. Yeah, it was, it was, all right. Um, one of the girls on my trip, she studied Wasulu singing. Uh, it's a, kind of a bridge between, it's, it's kind of a Mali and Ghanaian uh, art form. And it's, what's interesting is all the musicians are women, um, when traditionally the jelly or the uh, kind of the bard type class, it was male dominated. So this was, probably say this art form started in the 70s. Um, yeah, that's cool. We're going back to Tabaski. There was a parade of uh, various regions coming into Kankan, I guess. On the first, well, I should say this is Mamaya, actually. It's a three day holiday festival party. And the first day, Everyone wears blue bazen, and then the second day everyone wears white bazen, and then I think the third day changes from year to year, and it was green bazen, so just immerse in the sea of blue. Very pretty. And they have clowns as well. Um, it was great. Well, what I found most amazing about his uh, like art form was he knew exactly how to dance, and it would just be the tweaking of the correct way of dancing, which made it really funny. It's uh, good. I participated too. Yeah. Um, one of the other girls in our trip, she studied the balafone, which is like a xylophone, and that's her mentor. 
and instruction begins at a very early age. Uh, Goze there, he was, he's three years old and already knows how to play the bala. I'm going to move on to my secondary art form, that art discipline, which is Bogolan, mud cloth dyeing. It was a three-day workshop that we had with this man, Kader Keita, and it's simply just take a cloth, I think most of the time it was like rough cotton or a linen, and you apply a fixative to it, which will hold the mud on. And it's a process that was invented by women potters in Africa. There's, um, the fixative is actually a mixture of hibiscus leaves. Um, they've found other fixatives to work as well, but um, it's also a traditional medicine from anti-malarial. So the females, uh, taking care of the kids, would get, administer the medicine to their children, probably a dribble would form. When they went out to work in pottery, they would notice that after washing it, the area that had the fixative stayed on. And so what you're seeing is the first application on the, we're adding the pattern to it. And then once that's all laid down, you come over it again with the mud. And these examples um, are from Mali. What's interesting is the color changes that occur, depending on where you source the mud from. If it has a higher iron content, you're going to end up with a redder mud. And it's, I mean, one thing that I would like to see happen is maybe try this technique here with some local champagne mud and see what happens there. Um, hibiscus leaves are somewhat So the mud is the dye or does the mud resist? The mud is the dye. And wherever you put the mud down on the fixative, it stays. So for, yeah, this was actually done with stencils where I had a, just a stencil laid it on. The entire, sometimes you could start off with, oh, this is good, yeah. You see how this cloth is lighter in color, it doesn't have the dye, I mean the fixative everywhere. This is an example of, oh, actually I got this. This has the fixative everywhere on it. So you could just take the, the stencil and just paint on a broad stroke with the stencil and the mud will stay. And, and it's just a simple, you just wash it with water and it stays on. It's very cool, very easy. Um, I'm going to move on to the, the meat and potatoes of my experience there, which was broadcasting. Uh, like Denise mentioned, I went through Antioch University and what really triggered mm, the reason why I wanted to go there was the type of education. It's a mentor-apprentice relationship where you, in my case, I got to work one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I don't know if in the past they've had groups of students interested in bronze casting, but that's besides the point. It's just, it's a different way of learning than I find in our Western academic setting. And, like, that's how they've been doing it for thousands of years. It has a lot of history behind it, and it must work. This is my teacher. It's like a movie <laughs> time. Um, no, it's, it's not. They're Seiku. And, but I like to show that because it also shows that uh, children are really good at emulating, and so they can start learning at a very early age, which is typically the case in this type of uh, mentor mentee relationship. So, so Seiku is 36. He's been, he started when he was 13. So he has, what, 23 years of experience. Yeah. yeah, that's a cool thing. A lot of our um, clothes that we donate end up in West Africa. And for better or worse, they get sold there for profit. Um, but whatever. This is the end of my first semester, my first three months staying there. This is the show we put together. Um, the work on the left was made by Seku, the work on the right, that was made by me. It was, it was nice to have the, the kind of, for him I think it was a relatively new experience to have the work displayed in such a manner. It was, yeah, it was just really fun. Um, some details of the masks he made. These are probably about two thirds of the scale of the masks you see up on the table. And this was actually some of the first, this was the first piece I saw when I arrived in my homestay. And 
really, I was blown away. Um, just to see the level of detail, and like, I had so many questions when I saw this. Like, how did you turn a wax model into a rider, a cavalier? The tools we used are very simple. Um, we worked mainly with beeswax, actually solely with beeswax. And some of the tools we have are a paddle, just a um, glass bottle. What I find the most interesting is the use of a syringe. You would put heated wax into the syringe and just press it out like a Play-Doh mold. And you have these beautiful uniform strings, which are used a lot in ballet um, bronze work. And I should mention that's where Seku learned how his craft was in Cote d'Ivoire. He moved from Guinea to Cote d'Ivoire. And in, um, it was near Abidjan, which is the capital. It's along the coast. And finishing, um, just file sandpaper. The lemon we used as a final finish to just kind of brighten everything up. Sourcing material, we just went to the junkyard. <laughs> um, sometimes we would make trips to the metal yards, but a lot of times we, once people knew what we were making, they would bring us brass to just purchase. So it was nice not having to do any of the legwork. A lot of the material we also used is mud and sand. We used that a lot in creating the molds that we put around our wax models. We got the mud straight from the river. The sand comes straight from the river. There are people who make it a business of kind of working through the sand and processing it a little bit, but um, we ended up having to run it through a lot of sieves to get the coarser grains out. Here's the bead of swax in its raw form. Um, I don't know exactly where it comes from, just around. Uh, we would just go, simply go to the market to buy it and you would just buy by the kilo. We would melt it down, and then it's, it smelled great. This is probably the best smelling process in metals that I've ever encountered. It smells like honey. And then we just run it through a sieve into water to make a uniform sheet, which then we would later roll out to make thin planes, or we could cut this up and uh, make it. So, Here's an example of a lot of the, of just some of the finished, slightly finished wax works. Um, the darker wax has picked up more dirt over uh, reworking it, because a lot of times what we'll do is, like this is the freshest, most recently processed wax, the light stuff. To make the figures, we'll use a plaster mold. Like you make the initial form, and then you could invest it in a plaster mold a two-part mold, sometimes three, if you need. And then you heat up the wax and pour that in there. And you pour out the remaining. You don't let it get solid. And so these figures are actually hollow. And that's just like the skin, the shell of the wax around it. But since it's been reheated multiple times, it takes on a darker color. And it's kind of a shame, because a lot of times I love how these statues look in wax. And it's like, I don't want to take them to bronze. Edgar Degas is an example of someone who has managed to just keep a wax figure. Um, that's us working at our table, working outside, which is nice because we do, do generate a lot of smoke from our coal furnace. And simply, we're just heating wax on a knife over the furnace to make it more pliable to work it. Or, yeah, and then to kind of like solder joints together. We have just irons that we heat up and melt the models together. This was like one of the first days he showed me how to make some faces, and so I'm just playing around making some heads. Here's an example of that plaster mold I was telling you about. As you can see, there's a channel here where you would pour the wax into. This is nice for when you want to make many of one thing. Uh -huh. So you just heat up a whole bunch of wax, pour it in there, um, what we had to do, part, one step I am missing is you just, just add oil around your wax model when you want to invest it in plaster and then you can peel it out easily. The hands, that was just made by rolling, like when we're making a snake, and we added the appendages on later. Um, I think 
it's for an ease of a, a mold because um, they have the arms it's just another area that could be broken off and also when you're pouring it uh, you just have to think these are things we have to think about is just the fluidity of the material going into filling the mold and not having like back currents and stuff like that uh, I wish I could get more technical but whatever um, this was the image I used for my bracelet necklace series. Um, I just wanted something that I could make a unit that I could repeat, but also something that is ordinary because I'm working from, I wanted to work from the context of heavy African art that is, was worn by kings or the nobility class. And usually it's made in gold, the Ashanti um, art was made in gold, but I'm using a more base metal and just wanted a more ordinary object. It's an example of, this was actually a five-piece mold that I made for it, which is kind of ridiculous, but um, I had to. So we've had our wax model, and now we're going to invest it in clay. And so for bigger pieces, we would just, well, we have an initial layer of either plaster and sand or um, just clay, like a really a clay slip, actually. And we would just repeatedly dip it in there and build up the layer slowly. And that's just to kind of keep the fine detail. Later on, we can move to a coarser um, clay mixture of sand, and it just holds it together much better. So around the larger ones, too, because there's contraction and expansion of the material, we would wrap it in steel wire or rebar just to kind of strengthen the mold. Um, again, you see the reservoir, and that's just to help the ease of the pouring. gives you a, a target to shoot for, but also allows the wax to flow out um, nicely. Here's an example of pieces that are just coated in that first layer. That's just simple clay slip that you repeatedly dipped it in. And then you see the ones where we added the second layer of the coarser mold mixture. Um, some areas are drier than others. We're moving on to the burnout. And simply, it's just a fire. Uh, you kind of burn down your, your wood until it gets a nice coal. You just stick your molds in there, um, right side down, I guess, or just so like, the wax can drip out. In our instance, we lost the wax. The wax just gets burned and gets mixed into everything. We can't use it anymore. Um, what Seiku is aware of and what I thought I was being like real genius about is like, we should get something to catch the wax in. And he's like, I know, I just can't. You know, we just don't have the facility for it. So um, <coughs> working in a smokehouse, the crucible and the furnace is a very easy construction. Simply, it was a, a big iron or metal bowl that we just put a bunch of clay and brick in, and we run it and we heat it up by using a bellows, and, um, which was also manufactured in Konakry. Uh, yeah, it's a very low tech setup, but it worked. Uh, over here you see just some scrap, some slag that's the pour off, but we're going to reuse it in our burning. Um, yeah. So you're cranking. Yeah, power. cranking. It takes about an hour to bring it up to temperature. And then depending on the size of our crucible, an hour, hour and a half to. Is the fuel well, just wood? Yes, it's just charcoal. Um, so. I mean, one just looks at this and says, oh, I could easily just replace that with a gas burner <laughs> and, and a fan, too. And then you take a lot of the work out of it, which is nice. Um, sorting of pieces. But here we go. Here's what you see. We just throw pipe fittings and stuff in there. <laughs> and so I say I use bronze very loosely. Yeah. We don't really know. It's, um, it's a mixture of zinc, uh, copper, and tin. The proportions, they change every time because we are using materials that we just don't know. The molds have come out of the kiln, or the, the burnout, and we just line them up in a trench, getting ready to pour our metal into. And they're still hot at this point. Very hot, yeah. Probably around, I don't know, 400, 500 degrees. Uh, we're getting rid of all of the, the debris that builds up in the crucible. And Sometimes you'll have like, oh, here's an example. Some keys that were in there 
They just, you know, we throw a bunch of crap in there and it comes out. <laughs> yeah, and there's, and since we're also using a charcoal, a lot of that wood gets in there and we have to scrape all of that out. Um, but once it's good enough, you know, we'll just start pouring. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah. It's very hot. Um, <laughs> a thousand degrees Fahrenheit, approximately, give or take, depending on our metal compound. So just go down the roll, row pouring it, using. Yeah, I'll, I'll mention this. We're not really, <laughs> you know, very low tech. I don't think OSHA would approve of our work practices, but a lot of times I would actually have to come in and wet Seiko's feet just because they were getting so hot in the proximity to the thing. And I, I had the chance of doing this and yeah, it was, it was rough. Um, we just break apart the mold and we end up with our pieces, right? And then it's on to the fun stuff of filing sanding, which takes many weeks. Um, a lot of times things don't turn out as well as you hoped. Um, pieces break, areas don't uh, channels get clogged, and so you have to take it to a welder to fix it. And um, for the hollow forms, you have to hold an inner, um, like an inner area of mold or inside, so you have nails that hold that inside for when the wax burns out and you just have that shell. And so that's an example of what that is. Yeah, you see the nail head in there. That needs to be removed, it'll leave a hole, but we could fill that in. Some artists choose to leave the hole in there, but it's a simple, <coughs> just welding more of the same metal onto it. They're reattaching a head and it's in surgery. Um, this was a really, like a 10 pound anklet that I wanted to make and it just didn't work. So we have successes and failures and we just, the failures you just end up remelting and use them into another piece. So um, some bracelets I made for the uh, other students on the trip. The, the black is just simply just wood dust and glue. Um, looks all right. These are more of Seku's finished work. I'd like to end on the finished work to kind of wrap up the process, but yeah. What I like about these pieces is there, there is like an academic approach to the modeling of the figure, but in a lot of areas it's very abstract and in keeping with the tradition of more African forms where the, the arms are simple tubes and everything. But this surprised me to know that, you know, he has an understanding of how to make a really, like a fleshy leg and anything like that. So. What were your critiques like with him? I mean, I know you were doing a lot of um, the language is always an issue. Like I had such a basic understanding of Manika Khan. Um, what's nice about going to a foreign country where you don't know the language and studying art is it's such a, a visual process. He could just show me something and I don't really... So for the critique it was um, I would hand him a, a wax model, and then he would just say, like, it's good or bad. <laughs> um, I got to understand good and bad really quickly. Uh, so if it was bad, I would just remake it. Um, what I loved about his teaching process is he allowed me to struggle. I would spend an entire day working on a model, and then he would, at the end of the day, I would kind of like, an informal critique, he would say, okay, this is kind of working, but it's not really exact to what you're trying to make. And then he would take something and spend five minutes on it and have a more accurate depiction <laughs> of <laughs> what I was trying to make. But in doing so, I, I learned what I was doing and in like a more and better way to finish it off. So, um, but once again, that, that type of thing, it, um, being able to study for 10 hours a day just to work in a studio 10 hours a day, and then at the end of that experience, um, it's different from having like two and a half hours in a studio. Yeah. And so that, that was really unique for me.